I'm Drew Holmes. When I started learning to make music, I thought that the only way to have a career in the industry was as a performer. I could not have been more wrong. In more than 25 years in the music business, I've done many non-performing jobs from orchestra librarian to music store owner. But my experience is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm on a mission to explore the exciting and necessary jobs that make performances possible. Come with me as we go Beyond the Stage. All right, so before we start this episode of Beyond the Stage, I wanted to uh, give a little context for what you're about to watch or listen to. Now, this was recorded at the Midwest Clinic in Chicago in 2021, and so there's lots of people walking if you're watching the video and lots of background noise if you're listening to it. And uh, the person we're speaking to is uh, Heath Jones. He's from uh, Gwinnett County Schools in Georgia. He's been a professional educator for almost 30 years and is the uh, music technology chair for the Georgia Music Teachers Association. Why am I telling you all this? Well, he and I started our conversation and about four minutes in I realized we never actually did a formal introduction. So I want to provide some context for who we're speaking to and what we're speaking about. And uh, so I, without further ado, uh, in his own words, here is Heath Jones. You know, I, uh, I teach in Gwinnett County, uh, Georgia, which is about 35 miles um, northeast of Atlanta. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, in the state of Georgia about, I guess it's been about 15 years ago, the state legislature came in and they set up a, um, a package of tax incentives and tax breaks to try to lure uh, the film and television industry into our state. Um, like the show The Walking Dead. For, as one example, yeah. yeah the, I, I was a big fan of it. I kind of fell off it, but, you know, it, it, it did, did showcase uh, Atlanta pretty well. Yeah, The Walking Dead, uh, Stranger Things yep. uh, that are filmed there, um, Pinewood Studios, uh, which is just south uh, southwest of Atlanta, is like one of the, uh, it may be the, like the largest production studio in North America, but a lot of the... Uh, uh, Marvel Avengers movies were made there. Uh -huh. uh, Spider-Man, uh, Homecoming. Um, I remember, yeah, when Homecoming came out, I remember reading about that, that it was like one of the biggest sound stages in the country or the world at the time. It, it was a pretty incredible set. Yeah, it's it's one of the largest in the world. It's, it, it's amazing um, that Georgia is, is in the top five locations to make um, a film in the world. Yeah. Um, so, and the, the, some of the things that are interesting about it is, you know, a lot of the, the a lot of times people think about Hollywood as being California, you know, out around in L.A. The thing about it is, when they come to Georgia, the cost of living is substantially less um, than you know what it is uh, there on the West Coast, and. The tax incentives, uh, they, you know, they get, you know, up to like a 30% tax break on produce, and it's not that they have to produce the entire film in Georgia, you know, it's you know a percentage or whatever. But you know the, uh, you know, with some of the like the Marvel movies, that they were had an orchestra recording the soundtrack in London. Sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, but so most of the production has to be in Georgia, and then if you know, if you watch through the credits at the end, you'll see the little peach and the, the Lego. Peach, yeah. You know that they recognize that, but you know it's uh, when it literally costs less money to make the film here. The cost of living for those that work in the industry is less here, uh, even though you know the the union scale or whatever mm -hmm. you want to put it doesn't change. Um, and one of the other things really interesting to me when I was having a conversation with some um, folks that work in the industry. That one of the reasons why Georgia is so um, attractive is that we have all four seasons. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, you know, in Georgia, if you need to be on, on the ocean, we got the ocean. Uh, if you need to be in the mountains, we've got mountains. If you need to be in a big metropolitan city, we've got Atlanta. If you need, uh, you know, uh, a dilapidated barn out in the middle of nowhere, we got that too. So. Um, you, there are a lot of things uh, geographically and climate-wise that 
we've got it. You don't have to, you know, if you're in, in L.A. and you need a, a snowy scene, you've got to, <laughs> you know, well, make and, the snow. And you just touched upon why, you know, Peter Jackson filmed uh, Lord of the Rings in New Zealand was it was cheaper, but he had access to all of that kind of stuff, and, you know, scouting sets and whatnot, and the same thing. But, yeah, you said all four seasons, you know, in Georgia. I joke that, you know, in Colorado where we are, we have two seasons. We have construction season, and we have Christmas Day. <laughs> because it, it seriously goes year-round. But we're, we're digressing here. I'm sorry. Uh, Heath, introduce yourself. Let's tell yeah, who, who you are and what you do. I mean, I just... I do this. I just dive into conversations. No, it's, but, it's, uh, but you know, we're here at uh, at the Midwest Conference, and uh, we met up and started talking about you know podcasting and using technology to deliver content uh, uh, educationally. And uh, I really wanted to have this conversation, so I'm glad you had the time. So t- tell me who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name's uh, Heath Jones, and I'm a music educator. This is my 26th year in the classroom. Um, I spent. Uh, 15 years as a high school band director uh, before I moved into middle school I thought well how hard can middle school band be Uh, wow Um, so much respect to middle school band directors they are a different uh, animal Um, and through another conversation for another day I gradually made this transition into uh, music technology and the where I teach in Gwinnett County Georgia our high schools have had a music technology curriculum for a number of years. Mm-hmm. When I went to middle school, um, part of the story is uh, they wanted me to teach a general music class, which I wasn't really very interested in teaching, and students aren't very interested in taking. So yeah, it was like, uh, so what can we, what can I do to that would be engaging for the students? Um, and if you have engaged students, that makes teaching a lot easier. So technology, I, I basically went and said, I know there's some high schools out there that have this equipment. Why don't we teach this at the middle school? Can we get that equipment at our middle school? Um, so the following year we did. Uh, they, uh, Amazingly enough, I they gave me the equipment. It was uh, my school and five other middle schools. So we have 32 workstations, and at each workstation is a iMac desktop computer we the every station has a midi keyboard synthesizer um and you know we have some other uh everything's connected with the communication system uh so the students you know have their headphones on they can work so the the two problems were one i didn't know anything about technology and two there was no curriculum um other than that what's the problem exactly um so Literally, um, we were building the plane uh, as we were taking off. Yep. So, um, you know, after a year, when they came in and said, well, we've got to have a curriculum, and somebody's got to write it, and I don't know. They went, you, write the curriculum. Uh, me? Um, how hard could it be? <laughs> how hard could it be? But but here's the thing that was, uh, there's some serendipity in that, because when I sat down to create the curriculum, I had to write it in a way that I knew how to teach. And so my background is as a musician. I know I knew music, I knew how to teach music. Technology was what was unfamiliar. So right from the get-go, my approach to it is I'm not teaching technology because that's not really my expertise. Music is. So I treat the technology as an instrument of creation. So if you're a band director, you're not a how to play the clarinet teacher. You're trying to teach the music, you're trying to teach students about music and how to perform and be a musician. The clarinet just happens to be the tool that they're using and you have to teach them how to use the tool. Um, So the purpose of learning a clarinet isn't to know how to operate a clarinet, it's to make music. So the technology, the way I approach it is the purpose of the technology isn't to understand how to run a soundboard or a microphone, but how do you use that to create music? Um, So it's very grounded in music first. But if someone said, you know, you know, in a word, what is it you're trying to teach your students? For me, it would be creativity. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to teach them how to be creative. And creativity is different than imagination. You can imagine things all day and never act on it. In order to be creative, you have to act on that imagination. Sure. So to actually take an idea 
and develop that I, you know, just a thought um, and develop that into a finished product. And with my students, particularly at the middle school level, it's very introductory. So a lot of what I'm doing, and I tell people it's a mile wide and an inch deep. I try to show them all the things that they could potentially do with this that fall under the category of music technology, mm -hmm. which is kind of like saying, well, you could be a scientist. Well, there are hundreds of different scientists, which is kind of where we're eventually getting to with the industry in Georgia and non-musical non career paths sure, yeah. that there's, there's lots of potential there. So if the students discover something like, oh, like, creating a soundtrack or being a sound editor um, or, you know, doing, you know, live sound. Um, if that, if they find something like that that they're interested in, at our high school level, the high school curriculum is more detailed. They get a chance to kind of dig into the things they're most interested in. So, um, so yeah, but the, so what I'm doing with them first and foremost is uh, trying to show them all the things that they could creatively do with music or sound, really, I would, I would, you know, we call it music technology. I would really call it sound technology. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's a difference between content and context, and I've heard it said that the, you know, the glass is the context and the water is the content. And so, if depending on how big the glass is, what shape it is, then that's going to dictate what fits into it. And so you're giving them the context to understand you know, this technology has many applications, musical and otherwise, and it's up to you to put the content inside of it and then leverage that to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to do. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a great analogy, uh, you know, a way to look at it. And it's, um, you know, one of the things that gets to be, you know, somewhat frustrating um, because one of the things I try to do is try to connect our our school programs. I'm also the music technology uh, uh, division chair for the Georgia Music Educators Association. So our, our teachers group in the state of Georgia kind of head up all things uh, music tech. And did, did you mean to do that or did you miss a meeting? Uh, actually, that <laughs> that was fairly intentional. Good, um, good. Okay. So, and that was really interesting too because um, the person who was the head of that division before I took over was not involved with teaching music technology at all. Well, that's no good. Well, and it's the, but it's, but the reason for that is, you know, for many years, if you said music technology to a band director or orchestra director or something, to them that meant, oh, well, I can, uh, I have a metronome on my phone mm -hmm. or, you know, I can, you know, I can project an image of my score on a screen or something. It was, um, you know, digital tools or computer tools that they used to supplement their teaching tools, you know? So they didn't really, they, so they didn't think of, our music technology was not considered a content area. You know, they had choir, band, jazz band, you know, general music, but music technology was a tool. It wasn't content. So that was, but to, you know, their credit, um, you know, the leadership in GMEA was very open to, um, you know, creating that content area with teachers. So that's one of the things that I do um, is also to share with other music other music educators in my state that this is a content area and um, it's an option that's available for students and so I, I, I try to bring together our teachers um, the industry in our state and higher ed to um, you know kind of work together to continue to build this in Georgia and the industry and public schools are great. Um, they're very eager to get together because the industry understands that it's developing a workforce, uh, you know, there in Georgia. Uh, when this first started, all of the new employment in our state was, um, you know, contractors, electricians, builders who were like building the facilities. But the creative workforce, the script writers, the the 
uh, the music composers, the set designers, you know, that, that creative production part was having to come from New York City or LA or yeah. Vancouver. Um, so they were having to import that creative workforce. But now we're at the point in Georgia where the industry says, you know, for this to continue to thrive, we need to create that workforce here in our state. But it's also to the benefit of the, the kids and the citizens in our state to show them the career opportunities that are available to them right there. So that's a big part of, of what we're trying to do too. Um, because, you know, even you know, if a kid wants to be an attorney, well, the film and television and media and music industry is full of attorneys. You Unfortunately, know, yes. Or, you know, <laughs> if, if they want to be a chef, yep. uh, you know, if, if they're interested in uh, fashion uh, or makeup, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, that I've met, uh, Matthew Head, who's a television music producer, was telling me a story um, that he was on a set uh, one of the Marvel movies and there was a guy sitting over in a chair, you know, drinking coffee and he had, um, you know, a, a bag on the floor and uh, Matthew said he looked at somebody and was like, who is that? And he was like, oh, well, that's the physician um, huh. on the set. And and his, but the job of that physician was, was specifically to make sure that the, the stars of the movie didn't get sick. Sure. So, because he's like, you know, you have extras and all this other kind of stuff. You know, you, you set up your, your, your shoot schedule, but if all of a sudden your, your lead actor has a sore throat and everything stops. Yeah, if they can't talk, then you're dead in the water. You're dead in the water. He goes, but, you know, but in the industry, they hire physicians whose job is just to make sure that those people don't get sick. So, you know, you could, there's such a wide, no matter what you're interested in, there's probably a place in the entertainment industry that you can get involved with. You know, specifically when it comes to music and sound technology, uh -huh. there's a lot of stuff there too, which is where kind of the niche, the, the niche where, you know, I'm trying to teach kids, but also, you know, part of what we're doing is talking about like podcasting, sure. about what, what we're doing right here. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Beyond the Stage is proudly sponsored by Boomer Music Company, Northern Colorado's band and orchestra experts since 1976. If you need instrument rentals, repairs, sheet music, or accessories, Boomer Music has you covered. Come to our Fort Collins showroom or visit us online at www.boomermusiccompany.com. ThePodcastingStore.com is your one-stop shop for all things podcasting and remote learning and a proud sponsor of Beyond the Stage. Whether you're a novice remote teacher or a veteran podcaster, we have the gear and the knowledge to take your content to the next level to better engage your audience. Check us out at www.thepodcastingstore.com and see what solutions we have for you. Now, let's continue our journey Beyond the Stage. And a little bit about my background for non-performing careers in music, I uh, actually ended up working as an orchestra librarian for a while. And uh, I got my start in that in Philadelphia, and that was just, it, it's a long and sore to tell how that all goes, but you want to talk about an industry that I, would, I had no idea that that was even a job. I mean, you, you don't go into you know, classical music saying, I'm going to be a librarian, you go into, you know, and it's confusing what you do with how you do it. It's like, I'm a musician, I, I make these performances happen, but I'm not on the stage, I'm not the one that's out there doing that. And it's such a, an interesting role and a side of it that whenever I tell people, they're like, oh, of course there's someone that does that, there has to be. But that's not what you see uh, when you're growing up, it's not what you see from ground level. I mean, we went to the, uh, the CSO Brass concert, and I was pointing out to, to Braden, um, when uh, Carol, the librarian, came on, I'm like, yep, that's the librarian. She's put the scores out, she's making sure the, the folders are all there, because the players could do it, but how much can they do it? I mean, everyone needs, when you focus on your job, the thing that you do the best and that you're specializing in, everything is better for it. I mean, I've heard it called, uh, it's like an iceberg. 
and then you know you see a little bit above the water and the penguins and all that. But everything underneath that you don't see is what makes it happen. It's all that support staff. It's you know the the ushers. It's uh, the the administration. It's it, all of that factors into making that all happen. And the technologies is another uh, wing of all of that at this point. And I, I think it's a crucial one that needs to be kept in mind as we're going forward with delivering content. Uh, so in that vein, what, what kind of stuff are your kids doing? Um, well, we, you know, my curriculum, I, I base everything around the five elements of music. So we're talking about rhythm, melody, harmony, form, and expression. Uh -huh. So, you know, typically we'll start with rhythm and we'll be working either in GarageBand or, or Soundtrap, which is a great um, cloud-based DAW or digital audio workstation. And with rhythm, actually one of the things I start off with them is uh, an electronic instrument called a, a, a TR-808. It was made by Roland uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was referred to as a drum machine. Uh -huh. um, and it was an early, basically an early sequencer. But um, the way in, in an 808 is still, you, you'll hear, whether or not you know it, you, you'll still hear an 808 used in a lot of music today. But the way an 808's laid out is there's 16 buttons, and the buttons, those 16 buttons are grouped into groups of four that are, then there's like a group of red buttons, white buttons, yellow buttons, and orange buttons. And if you look at a modern doll, if you look at what we call the piano roll for a MIDI instrument, um, the way that that is organized is exactly like the 808. Hmm. So each color represents one beat. So you've got your red, your white, your yellow, your orange. There's four beats, and each of those beats is broken up into four parts. So that's where you get your 16 buttons. So I use the 808 to teach them about, you know, these four beats represent one bar. So when you look at the machine, you're looking at one measure of music. And then we'll go into the piano roll with the MIDI and go, now if you notice this, let's zoom in, you see, that you know we have these columns and rows, and in each bar, uh, you know the columns are broken down into 16 columns within a bar. And sometimes I have arguments with some of my traditional music colleagues <laughs> who ask, "Well, you're not teaching notation. They don't know. You know, they're like, do they name? Do you teach them the names of the lines and spaces on a music staff?" And I'm like, "No. Well, do you teach them how to draw a quarter and an eighth note?" And traditional notation and I go no and they go well don't you think they need to learn music notation I went absolutely I teach them music notation but that's not what I teach them and you know the purpose of music notation isn't to is to capture the musical idea and share it with other people yeah. so why did Mozart write down all of his music so he could capture his idea and then share that music hey here's the symphony I wrote here's your part so and with technology, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're creating at, we're creating ideas, capturing the idea, and then we're notating it in the computer. So they learn quarter notes and eighth notes and half notes and whole notes, but they learn what it looks like in the computer. And, uh, so well, and to someone who criticizes that, I'd say, well, use a computer, don't you? Like, yeah, well, what's that in binary? You know, do, you, do you know what the components of that are? Does it matter? And I was actually listening to a podcast uh, just uh, on the way out here. It was talking about how about alphabetical order, you know, why it's in that order, and the answer is no one knows. But the adoption of it was pretty uh, obvious when that came around, and they even had to have disclaimers in the front of books saying, well, instead of being in order of importance, so you, know, you might see servants before kings, but you know, here's the letters and how we're going to do it. Well, and they were talking about how we're actually shifting into a place where alphabetical order doesn't matter anymore because we're doing relational searches uh, based on the content, not by any key uh, that's you know, artificially applied on top of it. So it's the same thing. It's like, is music notation obsolete? I don't know if I'd go that far, but yeah, what you're saying is if you're not teaching them eighth notes, quarter notes, all that, are you still teaching them music? Of course you are. Yeah. And, you know, and, and as a band director or an orchestra director, well, yes, I'm teaching them that type of notation because that's the language yeah. or, that we use to communicate in that setting. In 
what I'm working with with my students in the digital world of music, there's no, it's trivia really. Uh, there's not a, uh, it's not necessary for them to know that. Um, you know, it's interesting when you mentioned about the alphabet because, um, you know, one of the things that, that I talk to my kids about that, you know, they all know Spotify. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, um, I'm sure I'm going to miss some of the details, but the gist of the story is, is as I understand it, is this. So the guy that started Spotify, you know, growing up, he wanted to be a rock star. You know, they had, you know, a garage band, you know, they, you know, went out and played some gigs and, you know, that's what he wanted to be. But, you know, it's kind of like wanting to be a pro athlete. It's, you yeah, know, not many people make it to that level. So, you know, that dream didn't come true. But he happened to be pretty good knowing about how to create a business and about, uh, you know, how to, you know, use this technology. So he took that passion that he had for music to develop this company that would become Spotify. Mm -hmm. And with the alphabet, you know, I tell my, when I, when I talk to my kids about Spotify, I said, so the thing about that company, like they had to have someone who understood algorithms because an algorithm is basically a mathematical system for sorting things. And I tell them, I said, the alphabet is, an, is based on an algorithm. Mm -hmm. You know, this, then that, then and this and this are the same, then this, then, and I said, so, you know, for Spotify, he had to have someone who understood uh, computer programming and computer language, but also understood algorithms and also had to have an understanding about music mm -hmm. so that they understood what musically is it that we're trying to uh, sort um, so that they begin, you know, it's like, how do they know what music you prefer? Well, because they have all these different data points that they put in this algorithm to go, oh, well, they like, they tend to like, uh, you know, bands that have two guitars and uh, a female singer that use minor keys, you know. And I think it's a great example of that, uh, you know. Whoever thought that being a musicologist would be an in-demand skill set? Oh my gosh. Uh, we wish we did then. So, but <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I'm teaching them how to create that, that music. You know, we'll move on to harmony, we'll move on to melody. Um, and they learn how to, you know, create this, you know, what, what it is. So, you know, even when it comes to, um, you know, teaching those things in a traditional way, uh, you know, again, we, they have to know how chords are notated in a doll. Um, and we don't use that on traditional, you know, manuscript paper. But, you know, they learn about, you know, chord progressions and how you craft a melody to go with that chord progression. Uh, we'll move on. We do a unit on lyric writing. Um, you know, how, you know, I love, you know, particularly middle school students. Like, do you ever feel like you're talking to your mom or a teacher or somebody and you're like, you know, I'm talking to you and you're just not listening to me. I said, you know, music can be a really powerful way to get people to listen to what you have to say. But so you sort of trick them into doing that. Yeah. And, um, and I went, the great thing that I love about music is you have to be able to tell the story in about three and a half minutes. And, you know, and so we, we start to talk about, you know, how you craft lyrics and rhyming schemes, which is, you know, ends up being a language arts lesson. And it's a formula. And it's a formula that has worked for a very long time. And you can try to invent a new formula, but you know, there's a reason why new Coke failed, because old Coke worked. So, it, it, yeah, it, you learn again. You learn the con context, and then you put your content into it, and then it's in a form that people can digest and understand. Yeah, and yeah, and that's one of the challenges with uh, with you know teaching students. And I, I'm not casting dispersions on anyone but we do a very good job of, of conditioning students to believe that the secret to success in school is to get to the correct answer as quickly as possible and avoid wrong answers at all costs so in my class um, you know they'll create something and they'll be very they don't want to turn it in or share it because they're like well it doesn't sound very good and I'll tell them, you know, so with this assignment, show me where in the assignment it said you had to create a four bar drum track that sounds great. 
Now the assignment says it's got to be four bars. You got to use these three different sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I tell them, I am evaluating you on are you learning the process. I'm not evaluating you on your product because the thing about it is, I said anybody you listen to on the radio or Spotify that you like, the reason you like them is because one day they decided they were going to start making music. And on that day, they were terrible. Mm -hmm. But they came back the next day and they kept trying to make music. And the next day it wasn't quite as bad. And they kept doing that until one day they were pretty good. And um, so, you know, I, I try to tell them part of the process of learning how to do I, I'm like, I tell them, you're going to make a lot of music that doesn't, you're going to make a lot of really bad sounding music sure. before you ever start making something that sounds good. I went, but if you don't make that terrible sounding music, you're not ever going to get, you know, to that other point. So, um, you know, finally, uh, it takes a while to convince them that, you know, learn the process and through doing it, you're going to get better. But they're like, it doesn't sound right. I'm like, well, and the other way I look at it, um, I haven't done done them in a while, but I like doing um, like obstacle course races, mud runs, things like that. And training for that, it, it's a mental game unto itself. And when you realize that working out today isn't training for the event, it's training for the next workout. So you're getting in shape to do the next workout, which is getting you in shape to do the next one. The only workout that you're actually training for the event is the last one. Because then you do the event, and by then, if you're prepped, the event isn't the accomplishment. It's the celebration of the accomplishment, which is being being ready to do it. Yeah. Having gone through the process. So yeah, if on day one you say, well, it doesn't sound you know, like uh, you know, Britney Spears, of course it doesn't. And it shouldn't. Because if it did, you waited too long to start. Right. You, you should have been doing this years ago. Yeah. It, it's going to sound like wherever it sounds like, it's going to start wherever it starts, but then it's going to progress. And you know, today's bad practice session is going to make you better for tomorrow's session. It's going to make you better for the day after. And it really builds upon itself. And I, I think we you know, waxing poetic, you know, live in a society that you know, stands in front of a microwave saying, faster, faster. Right. You know, it's, we have to put in the work to figure out the processes to make the product be what it is that we're trying to get to, whatever that happens to be. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Stage. If you have ideas for future episodes or work in a non-performing role in the music industry and would like to tell your story, please contact me at drew at boomermusiccompany.com. I'm Drew Holmes. Thank you for listening as we explore careers in music beyond the stage.